Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Sunday, everybody. Normally we take Sundays off, but this week has been so busy, and there's been a few、uh, important developments on the China side that I could not find time or space for in previous videos. And I fear that next week will also be a very busy week, so I wanted to do a special episode today to touch on these important developments before we move into the new week. My apologies for interrupting your、uh, Sunday, your day of rest, but I think we need to cover some of these. So let's do that with today's special Sunday episode. On Friday, China's massive chip-making company, Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp, through an exchange filing, announced plans to invest 7.5 billion U.S. dollars to build a 12-inch wafer production line in Tianjin, a major port city, an hour or so from Beijing, by high-speed rail. SMIC, the largest contract chip maker on the Chinese mainland, said the new plant would have a production capacity of 100,000 wafers per month, which can provide foundry and technical services for technology nodes ranging from 28 nanometers to 180 nanometers. The company said that the products made for this new manufacturing line will be for telecommunications, cars, consumer electronics, and other applications. The plant will be built and Operated in cooperation with a local state-owned enterprise, as well as two local government authorities, which will provide subsidized land, infrastructure, and other subsidies. Earlier this year, SMIC began building a new plant in Shanghai, and two plants that are under construction in Beijing and Shenzhen will start operation at the end of this year. Strong global demand for advanced chips, as well as more basic chips, used in everything from smartphones to new energy vehicles to fighter jets, has exploded in recent years, albeit with signs of cooling now this year. And chip makers have been scrambling to take this new market space. And of course, we know too that semiconductors are a critical advanced technology, which are increasingly taking center stage in U.S.-China competition. Indeed, one of the reasons for greater chip manufacturing capacity needs in the mainland is concerns of fresh U.S. trade sanctions. We remember that two weeks ago, Washington-based Bureau of Industry and Securities started to enforce new export controls covering technologies for the production of advanced semiconductors. On grounds of national security, and this month, U.S. President Joe Biden signed into law the Chips and Science Act, committing tens of billions of federal dollars to U.S. chip manufacturing. Back in March, the U.S. Commerce Secretary warned that the U.S. could effectively shut down SMIC by denying it access to American tools and software if it sold semiconductors to Russia. Though the PRC is substantially behind the United States, South Korea, Taiwan, and others in the chip race, lacking software, equipment, and talent, Beijing still has its own plan for competing in the critical space. A state-led quest for greater self-sufficiency in the semiconductor industry and less reliance on foreign technologies. General Secretary Xi Jinping himself has repeatedly urged the country to address the strategic choke points, as he puts them, in advanced technologies, including, indeed, especially in semiconductors. While the massive amounts of money poured into the effort has no doubt achieved some success. As we have seen this year, with several high-profile arrests, corruption and graft remain a familiar problem. The new goals carry old vices. Perhaps the most infamous example was Wuhan Hongxin Semiconductor Manufacturing Company (HSMC), a multi-billion-dollar hoax, which in the end didn't even make a single chip. But there are novel challenges too. The sector is dependent on global supply chains at a time of choppy geopolitical waters. There is also the convincing argument that self-reliance could be self-defeating and simply lead to isolation. Quote, At a recent annual industry conference in the eastern city of Nanjing, various Chinese experts said it would be impossible for China to tackle semiconductor bottlenecks all on its own, and that there is not a single country on the face of the planet that can build a chip industry based entirely on domestic procurement. End quote. 
The Hong Kong publication in a separate article interviewed Andy Jiang, the former chief technology officer for the cloud business of Huawei, who said that there is a huge chip bubble in China. And quote, many chip design firms are claiming to produce breakthrough products in just 12 to 18 months, which is too short a time. It takes at least six years to produce a chip from scratch. End quote. More than 820 semiconductor-related fundraising deals were made in China from January 2021 to the first half of this year, raising more than 15 billion US dollars. China has seen mixed results in the past with its state-run industrial model, from telecommunications to steel manufacturing, and the jury is still very much out on whether Beijing will see much success in this approach for semiconductors now, and if successful, at what cost? Whatever happens, we will be following it here on China Update. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to hit the like button. And as always, anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep China Update sustainable and primarily subscriber supported, uh, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. This is the best way of helping me keep the channel financially sustainable and continue producing episodes for you guys every day, including on Sundays, as we can see. Okay, next up, the housing crisis. It's a short but important development that I wanted to cover but couldn't find time uh, previously this week, so I wanted to cover it today. Now, we know, of course, that the housing crisis is so interconnected with the wider economy. At this point, there is almost daily developments in almost every aspect of the crisis. Today, we need to discuss the distressed asset market uh, quickly, though it is not very sexy, the sector is important for the economy and for our understanding of the ongoing crisis. UK-based Japanese-owned Financial Times writes over the weekend that distressed asset managers in China's private sector are struggling to profit from the country's slowing economy. Quote, with no bottom in sight for its collapsing property sector and lenders reluctant to write off bad loans. End quote. Almost a dozen distressed investment firms told the outlet that they have not increased their exposure to residential and commercial properties, which are usually the most popular form of collateral in Chinese debt restructurings, despite soaring defaults in the real estate sector. One executive specializing in trading bad loans expressed, quote, A lot of us are standing by not knowing where to spend our money. End quote. And the managing director of Orient Capital Partners in Hong Kong said that distressed asset management only works when you think there is going to be a mark to market pricing and a cyclical improvement. But, quote, if you don't have adequate pricing and you have a structural downturn that could go on for another decade, then there is no way you can sell your assets. End quote. The mortgage boycott movement is a real wild card with all this too. The scale of pre-sold homes which have not been finished is massive. And as we can see with this chart, there is a huge stock of uncomplete apartments. And now developers do not have the liquidity to finish many of them. Households owe money on these mortgages, which are held by banks. Many of which, as we explored yesterday, do not want to touch developers, despite government directions to do so. Hot potato, musical chairs, pick your metaphor. It's a tricky situation. And it looks like state-run bad asset managers are stepping in. However, at 20-30% to 30 of GDP, these players simply do not have the ability to shoulder the ills of the housing sector if, as many argue, the crisis is truly systemic. Quote, China is suffering one of the worst economic slowdowns in decades after government efforts to reduce debt in the property sector, which accounts for about a third of economic output, led to a collapse in real estate prices. Banks are offloading existing bad debt, but are mostly transferring it to large, state-run asset managers, such as China Huarong Asset Management and Great Wall Asset Management. End quote. Okay, that is today's special Sunday episode of China Update. Not very sexy, a little bit boring, but very important to cover. And I didn't want to leave it when we moved into next week's developments. I hope you all got some value from the episode. Thank you very much for watching. Enjoy your Sunday. And I'll see you for regular episodes back tomorrow.